Stephen whenever they were stoning him to death and he said lay not this sin to their charge we talked about the centurion soldier how that he stood at the foot of the cross and he looked up into the face of forgiveness and heard that man that had been beaten and spit upon and whipped and crucified look down at those people that were gambling for his clothes and calling him a devil and instead of saying I curse you he said father forgive them for they know not what they do Amen. Amen. We read about a man that had been forgiven of more than a trillion dollars worth of debt. Yet Brother Bill, when he found a, a servant of his that owed him fifteen dollars, he couldn't bring himself to forgive him. Boy, it sounds like us, don't it? God forgives us of so much, yet we can forgive of so little. Hallelujah. That ain't what I'm preaching today. We learned last week that Jesus said in Luke 6 and 44, for every tree is known by his fruit. It's known by who? Those that looked upon the tree. How many times have you ever thought, wonder what kind of tree that is? Oh, there's apples hanging on it. It's an apple tree. Mom used to have a pear tree. It was out there for years and years. And I guess even whenever Granny had it there, it was there putting forth better pears than it did for us. But... You didn't have to guess what it was. Now some people, if you see it bare, like Tyler's granddad on his mama's side, Mr. McBride, he might be able to look, you know, and say, that's a pear tree, even though it ain't got no pears on it. But for the most part, the only way most of us simple-minded people, Brother Bill, can tell what kind of tree it is is by the fruit that it bears. Yeah. Amen? For most of the world... The only way they're going to know what kind of tree you are is by the fruit that you bear. And we learned last week that this fruit that it's talking about ain't talking about the way you dress. Uh-uh. We like to use it that way. We like to look at a woman to wear a pair of slacks and say, well, I can tell by her fruit. She ain't right. That ain't her fruit. Amen? Amen. Not saying that he's, that, you know, I know there's preachers that say, don't matter how you dress, oh, it does too. It matters. But that ain't your fruit. Amen? Amen? The Bible tells us in Galatians what the fruit is that Jesus is talking about that would be born by Christians and that fruit is the fruit of the Spirit. Right. It is love. It is joy. It is peace. It is long-suffering. It is gentleness and goodness and faith. Meekness and temperance. Against such there is no law. That's the fruit that He's talking about. Amen? Amen? Convincing somebody that you know Jesus and that they need to know Him ain't going to come about because you've got long sleeves on and a tie on and you're all fancied up and you got your hair short and you got everything just parted just right and everything's just right in order and all. It's going to come whenever they see your love in action. Amen. When you begin to reach out a hand of help toward them and they begin to see something inside of you and they think, you know, I wouldn't have took the time to stop. It's too hot. It's too, I've got, I'm too busy. i got too much to do. Yet there's people that I know have better things to do and it was hard on them yet they took time to help me. And you're going to start convincing them that you got something that they don't got. We're talking about having the nature of our Father. We're talking about that war that Paul talked about that goes on inside of us. He said, I find in my members something else warring there. There's a battle that goes on between your spirit and your flesh. Your carnal sin nature and your new nature. The nature of the Father. The nature of the Spirit that has been, inside of, been planted inside of you. When you're born again, your flesh wants to tell somebody off, but you don't let him because your spirit said that ain't the way it's supposed to be. Your flesh wants you to cuss, but your spirit don't let it because your spirit says no. Out of the same mouth comes blessings and cursing. These things ought not be. You ain't supposed to be that way no more. Your conversation ain't supposed to be that way no more. So as we begin to feed our spirit and we begin to feed upon the Word of God and we begin to pray and get a closer walk with the Lord and we begin to see our spiritual man grow, then our flesh gets weaker and we find it easier not to cuss and we find it easier to be able to reach out a helping hand and not even give a second thought. Whenever we see somebody in need, we find those things easier, but... If we feed our flesh more, and I know we've heard this before, if we feed our flesh more, our spiritual man begins to get choked out by the works 
of the flesh. Which He describes to us right before He tells us what the fruit of the Spirit is. This is the fruit of the flesh. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath. Did you hear that? Strife. Did you hear that? Seditions, heresies, envies, murderers, or murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of which I tell you before, as I have told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now how important is it that you allow the nature of God to grow in your life? I'll tell you how important it is. Because sooner or later, if you allow your flesh to have its way, sooner or later your flesh will take you to hell. Always has, always will. Amen. The, you give it, somebody told me a few days ago I went out to take out the trash and there was a man out there growling about the kids and he said you give them an inch and it'll take five miles that's the way your flesh is that's the way the devil is that's the way the world is amen that's why we need to spend more time on our faith seeking God and asking Him Lord change me I don't like my attitudes I don't like the fact that I can't get along with my brothers and sisters I don't like the way that I feel toward those people that I think have done me wrong even though they might have done you wrong we need to say Lord help me to forgive them and get past that so we have seen how that forgiveness and our actions how that they show forth the light of the Lord in other people's lives. Jesus said a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. He goes on to say, first He says you're the salt of the earth, Brother Beal. But if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and be trodden underfoot. Then He says you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Then he says, Neither do men light a candle. I'm in Matthew, the fifth chapter. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. He says, why would a man light a candle and then take that candle and put it under a bushel and hide it? As a matter of fact, Luke even says, to take the, why would a man light the candle you know, and take it and hide it in a secret place? Most of the church, the only time they get their light out from under the bushel is on Sunday morning. The rest of the week they keep it hid. Mm -hmm. Amen? Yeah. My, my question for you this morning and the title of this morning's sermon is Does Your Bushel Smell Like Smoke? Amen? Do you get it at your light out on Sunday morning and let it shine in front of your brothers and sisters but for some reason during the week you keep it hid all the other times? Do you know what happens if you hide a candle under a bushel? It goes out. If you keep it under there long enough, Brother Bill, Brother Sleece, if you cut the oxygen off, the fire can't survive. And it begins to go out. So for what reason do you get your light out on Sunday morning behind four walls and then when you go outside out on the streets, you hide it so, so, so far under the bushel that the world don't know whether you're saved or whether you're lost. The world don't know whether you, whether you got, they don't know if you got anything. Because you keep your light hid. Jesus says, let your light shine. Put it on a candlestick so that it can shine light to who? To all that are in the house. So that they can see your what? Your works. Your actions. And when they see your actions, they will know who your Father is. Because when they see your God-like actions, the Bible says they will glorify your Father which is in heaven. Amen. Amen. Talking about, you know, we always sing, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Amen? Well, the church can usually sing along with that as long as it's inside their church. The rest of the time, it's this little light of mine, I'm going to hide it today or whatever. Amen? Going to hide it in the secret place. Going to put it under a bushel. Going to hide it. I don't want nobody knowing. Whether it's because you're embarrassed to be one of them Jesus people or whether you just want to fit in with the crowd. And if you let your light shine, you don't fit in with the crowd because you don't. 
You don't fit. Once you have been born again and Jesus Christ becomes your Lord and Savior, you do not fit in with the crowd. I'm talking about the world, world, the crowd of the world. The ones that drink, the ones that don't, the ones that tell their filthy stories and their jokes, and the ones that cuss every breath. You don't fit in with them no more. You've been called out of darkness. Now there's been a light. Jesus said when He was here, He said, For now I am the light of the world. But when I leave, you will be the light of the world. He says here, A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Let your light shine before men. How does it do that? Your actions. The things that you do. I ain't talking about standing on the street corner thumping the Bible. Now if God tells you to do that, ain't nothing wrong with it. But I'm talking about your everyday life. The people that we... Oh, I'm preaching on me this morning. The people that we come in contact with, Brother Bill, do we leave them better off or do we leave them worse than they were whenever we pass their, when we cross their path? Amen. When people look at our lives... Do you remember what we talked about with when Jacob got to Esau and he looked into Esau's face? He saw the face of forgiveness and in that he said... You know, it's as though I have seen the face of God. And we talked about that. When people look into your face and they see forgiveness, they see the nature and the face of God. When they look in your face, Sister Nancy, and they see bitterness, and they see strife, and they see unforgiveness, and they see vengeance, and they see self-righteous hypocrisy, they don't see the face of God. They see a face all right. But it ain't the face of God. Amen. So today as we have been, we're talking about the nature of our Father and our old nature. And looking at our lives with the spiritual flashlight and trying to decide which one do we allow to shine the most. Which one do we allow to show the most before men? If things don't go my way and I'm out in public, how do I act? If someone does me wrong and I'm out in public, how do I act? If someone, I don't like them, I can't, I've heard people say, I can't stand them. Well, then you need to pray about it. Because Jesus said, if you can't love your brother who you have seen, how can you love God who you haven't seen? Jesus said if you can't forgive others, the Father can't forgive you. Oh, that's pretty still. That's pretty stiff best in there, isn't it? Truth anyway. Amen. Truth anyway, Brother Slee said. How do we act in front of others? What is our actions doing to other people's lives? And you know what? It's not always our actions. Most of the time it ain't. It's our reactions that people see. Amen. How we react whenever we're out in public and something goes wrong. How we react when someone decides to do you wrong. Well, Paul said, before we were saved, we were children of wrath. Children of disobedience. We'd get mad. Stomp our feet. Soul up. Tell them off. Give them a piece of our mind. Amen. We ain't supposed to do that today. Amen. The next time you get ready to give somebody a piece of your mind, and trust me, you better quit that. You ain't got much left. The next time you get ready to give somebody a piece of your mind, stop for a minute. Take a deep breath. Count to ten if you have to. But ask yourself the simple question that so many people wore on their t-shirts and their hats and their bracelets and their license plates. What would Jesus do right now? Because i got news for you. You are the only Jesus that some of the world are ever